You got it. Welcome. Hello and welcome everyone to our town hall. Uh, we're so happy to have you all here. I just wanted to bring attention uh, to those that um, would prefer to listen to our presentation in Spanish. Uh, you can click on the, um, and this is in the chat in Spanish, you can click on the um, interpretation symbol at the bottom of your screen and uh, choose Spanish. We ask that you don't choose the English channel because that will get confusing. So we only choose the interpretation icon if you would like to uh, choose the Spanish option. Okay, let's uh, let's begin. We are so excited to share with you our strategies for the state and federal stimulus funding. My name is Mary Alice Cohen, and I am the director of the Office of Early Childhood at the Department of Human Services. I would like to start um, by sharing a heartfelt thank you uh, to each and every one of you that helped. All of us developed these strategies. Um, we had parents, caregivers, early childhood professionals, advocates, businesses, foundations, early childhood councils, um, our state intermediaries, our legislators. So many were at the table with us um, figuring this all out together. And um, this plan that we're sharing with you tonight reflects all that we have learned uh, from you. So thank you. Um, I also want to extend a thank you to Early Milestones uh, who helped to facilitate this uh, stakeholder process, um, as well as they researched uh, what was happening in other states. And, um, and then they also really um, took time to dig into all of their research that they have done across our state on how this pandemic has affected children and families and providers and what we need uh, in our recovery process. So thank you to Early Milestones. And I'd also like to extend a very special thank you to our Spanish interpreter, Patricia. Mm -hmm. um, so we have quite a bit to cover uh, in a very short amount of time tonight. Um, so we will be following up with additional town halls uh, where we can dig into some of the more complex strategies. This uh, meeting is being recorded. So uh, for those that weren't able to make it tonight, um, they'll be able to watch. And, um, and then we'll be sharing uh, materials here shortly uh, that are in English and in Spanish that have all the details of uh, what we're gonna be covering tonight. So, um, Please be sure to add yourself to our Office of Early Childhood mailing list um, through the link in the chat that Lynn Lee will be adding uh, so that you stay informed on upcoming town halls and when, uh, when program applications are available. So as we move through all of the content tonight, um, please add your questions in the chat. Um, we will likely not get to all of them because I know there'll be so many questions that will come up as we review all of this. So what we're going to do is pull together um, a frequently asked questions document of all the questions that come up in the chat tonight. And we will follow up with an email to everyone um, with the responses to those questions, as well as information on follow-up town halls where we can really dig into, um, into the more complex strategies. So um, I, we have a number of our OEC leaders on the call tonight um, who will be available at the, at the end after we wrap up our presentation to, uh, to answer your questions. Uh, we have Angela Benzekri, our Early Childhood Workforce Manager, Heather Craiglow, who is the Director of the Head Start Collaboration Office, and the Fostering Wellbeing Unit. And we have Karen Rosa, who is the Director of the Division of Early Care, Care and Learning Licensing and Administration. Uh, we have Kendra Dunn, who is the Director of the Division of uh, Community and Family Support. We have Lisa Castig Castiglia, who is our CFO. And uh, we have Todd uh, Jorgensen, who is our Deputy Director of the OEC. I also wanted to call out their names because um, as we move forward with launching these strategies, they'll be your go-to people um, for as we um, as we implement all of this. So presenting the slide deck with me tonight, um, we have Grace Eckel, who is our Senior Policy Advisor for the Office of Early Childhood, and Scott Kuginski, who is our Special Advisor to the Governor. 
Scott um, has been a just a phenomenal partner in this process. We have relied on his deep content expertise developed over decades of experience in the early childhood field. Um, so I will pass it over now to special advisor, Scott Kurgensky. Thank you, Mary Alice, and thank you all for joining us today. We're so excited about the investments Colorado will be making with the federal and state stimulus funds, including the recently announced ARP Child Care Stabilization Grants, which were announced a couple of days ago. What you're gonna see presented to you today addresses a comprehensive range of concrete child care needs and the resources to support them, as well as other kinds of early childhood programs and supports. The funding will strengthen the early childhood industry and profession through increased access, affordability, quality, and children's health. Together, these represent thoughtful plans informed by early childhood stakeholders across the state. And the governor is really enthused about it as they reflect his top priorities. Hello. May I ask everybody to please mute their phones? Thank you. The investments will help child care in Colorado recover from the pandemic and prepare for important and expand extensive expansions such as universal preschool and other services. The American Rescue Plan or ARP Act Stabilization Grant will build on previously approved plans to pro provide base funding for licensed childcare programs over the next nine months to sustain them. The funds will reduce families' tuition and co-payment costs. They'll expand grants for workforce recruitment, retention and compensation. They'll advance funding for facilities, prioritize care for infants and toddlers, provide incentive payments for higher quality and licensing programs, license programs. They'll establish family child care home navigators and support young children's health and mental health. We're going to hear a little more, we're going to hear a little more details now. And for that, I'm going to turn it back over to Mary Alice Cohen, the director of the Colorado Department of Human Services Office of Early Childhood, or OEC. Great. Thank you, Scott. Okay, so the strategies that we are going to share with you today are funded with both federal and state stimulus funding. Mm -hmm. Oh, um, hello. Are you able to mute uh, folks that aren't muted? Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thanks, everyone, for muting their phone, your phones. Okay, so um, the strategies we're going to share, as I was just mentioning, are both federal and state stimulus funding, and specifically the American Rescue Plan um, Child Care Stabilization Grant, which is 90% direct aid to providers. So what you're going to see tonight is the funding that is going directly to providers. Um, and it also includes um, the funding for the corona um, Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations, which I think you're probably familiar as um, having um, it, as being referred to as the CURSA funding. So both of these fundings, CURSA and ARP, American Rescue Plan, they must be spent by September 2023. So we're on a pretty tight time crunch to get this amount of funding out the door. Um, you'll also see some stimulus funding uh, in here that was actually state general funds. Um, so please know, this is really important um, for all of you to know, that this town hall does not include two other pots of funding from ARP, which total about $197 million. So what, you're, what is not included today, and then what will follow up um, later with um, additional town halls, is the $18 million, which is the 10% uh, reserve from the um, the stabilization funds that we have um, some flexibility with. And then um, 178 million, which is the flexible supplemental discretionary funding. So I wanted to share that the department prioritized the funding that was going directly to providers because we need to get that into your hands as quickly as possible. Um, but during that whole stakeholder process that I referenced at the beginning, we're utilizing all of the feedback that you provided in that engagement process as we dig into the 10% and the supplemental discretionary. So what you don't see here reflected tonight 
um, will be reflected in those other um, funding streams. So, um, so let's see here. Um, in regard to the supplemental discretionary, our time frame on that is that we will be submitting um, a, a request to our legislators in January to reflect that money. So I know that's confusing with all these different funding streams, but I just wanted to, to share that with you before we start, we jump in. Okay, so um, before we launch into the strategies, I'd like to take a moment uh, to ground us in the OEC, why and how. Um, next slide, please. Uh, great. So here you will see that the Office of Early Childhood's mission is to support families and communities so that every child in Colorado thrives. That is our focus for everything we do. And then on the next slide, you'll see st um, six strategies. Um, these six strategies are increasing access to high quality learning environments, supporting our early childhood workforce, strengthening our families um, and our communities, uh, raising awareness about the needs of children and families, aligning our funding streams, and ensuring that OEC has a strong culture to launch this work statewide. So today's focus on the next slide, you'll see we're gonna address three core strategies, access, workforce, and family strengthening. Okay, so we have created overview documents um, with additional details on all of these stimulus documents. And so Lindley's gonna put that in the chat for you. Um, and uh, we're going to go through all of these strategies, first access, then workforce, then family strengthening, but know um, that all of the content we're sharing tonight is reflected in these documents. Um, it's a lot of information as I go through each slide. I'll pause, let you take a look at the slide, I'll do a high level overview and most importantly, what you need to know next to access this funding. So um, let's dig into access. So, um, so the access strategy um, is we wanna ensure that all families have equitable and easy access to high quality early care and education services so that all children start ready, um, school ready to succeed. Um, uh, oh, thanks, Lindley. Um, next, uh, next slide. Um, so this is the, the one that I, we're just so thrilled to share with you and excited to get out the door. So it, what we need to do with um, our child care stabilization grants, this first activity number one, is to stabilize our child care sector. This funding, this 221.7 million, will be given out to our providers across the state. We have about 4,700 providers as direct payments over nine months that you will have the flexibility to, to utilize according to your needs of your child care center or your family child care home. Um, so there's, we heard that you needed flexible funding uh, to meet your unique needs. What we also heard from you and is incorporated here is we know that it's more expensive to, for it, to provide infant toddler care, to provide care for children with special needs, and to provide care at non-traditional hours. So we are adding bonuses um, to these monthly grant payments for providers that are offering these three types of care. Um, so these flexible reoccurring grants to providers will support you all um, just to, to move through this pandemic of recovery. And, um, and we need to maintain our mixed delivery childcare capacity as we prepare for the implementation of universal preschool in the fall of 2023. So this is focused on getting the money to you all that you so desperately need to keep your doors open so that children have access to high quality learning environments and parents can return to the workforce. Um, of the total grant that you see here, um, providers will use half to reduce or eliminate family tuition. And we'll get to that at the during the family strengthening section. Scott will, uh, will share out about that. Okay, next slide. Um, 
So this slide, I know it's hard to see because of um, the font, but we'll um, send out the slide deck so you can um, blow it up. But this here is the total base grant amount for providers by capacity and quality level. So the first table that you'll see here shows the total grant, and then the second table shows the month, um, the per month payments. Um, and please note when you're when you're looking at this and finding where you are on this, um, this does not include the bonus amounts that I mentioned um, for infant toddler care, special caring for children with special needs and non-traditional hours. That bonus is not reflected here. Okay, so be sure to keep put, put your questions in the chat as we go through. Don't wait till the end because you'll forget your questions because we have a lot of activities we're covering. So as we go through this, as you have questions, please add them um, into the chat so we capture them. Okay, so now we go on to um, the second activity, um, which is providing financial, okay, hold on, let me, let me pause. So in order to address access, we have two approaches. One is we need to stabilize our early childhood sector. The second approach, which we're about to dig into now, is increasing access um, with new innovations that we heard from all of you. So now we're moving into the increasing access uh, to, to care with new slots. Um, so this one is helping employers to create on-site childcare. This is 8.8 .8 million in funding um, for an estimated 10 to 25 uh, childcare centers. Um, and interested employers um, should go ahead and fill out the interest form uh, to be alerted when the application opens. Um, and Lindley will add that link um, here in a moment. Oh, she just did, great, thank you, Lindley. Um, so uh, next slide. Um, so this, okay, so as we met with all of you, parents, providers, advocates, businesses, foundations, I mean, everyone in our um, early childhood sector, we heard so many incredible innovative ideas that reflected the needs of your community. And so that's what activity three is about. It's about supporting you all to lift up innovations that meet the needs of your community. and. Um, we, our state is so diverse, right? And challenges range from community to community. So this is about you coming together with partners in your community to lift up innovations across our state. Um, and on this, um, um, this third activity here is, it's 20, almost $25 million for innovation grants. So really just, we want you to submit whatever innovation you have, we can coach you and support you um, as you figure out your innovations, as well as um, our, uh, provide, our partners across the state will really lean in to, to help you um, come up with your, your strategy. But what we want to see innovations around are one, how can you address affordability of childcare? Two, um, how can you address the lack of infant and toddler care? Um, three ideas on strengthening um, child care providers' business practices, um, workforce preparation, and more. So really um, dig into this together in your community to figure out what you need and then how we can support you to lift that up. And we can't wait to see what you come up with. Um, and this will be a competitive grant process um, starting late November. Um, so, and just to clarify, so the activities I'm going on into now are, are competitive where the, um, the first strategy that is the bulk of the money on this is not competitive. It's for every single open and operating licensed childcare center or qualified CCAP qualified exempt. And we're gonna get into in a moment how we can support those that are unlicensed that wish to become licensed um, with, uh, with the support to become licensed. Okay, so now we go to the next slide. Um, is activity four, um, and this is, um, we heard from you the, the, the cost of increasing quality um, levels. And so 
We want to support you to increase the quality of care that you're providing to, to children and families. And so we'll have bonus payments for you, um, ranging from $2,000 to $4,000, um, um, depending on the quality or level. Um, and programs should apply through the existing Colorado Shines QRES system. Um, and they can expect to receive the bonus in like four to six months once the rating process is completed. On the next slide, um, activity five. Okay, so um, we, um, we have a significant challenge ahead um, with the implementation of universal preschool and making sure that we have a really strong mixed delivery system to provide families with the choices that they want uh, to make uh, for what they feel is best for their children and their family. So how do we build that mixed delivery system effectively? We know that um, so many family friend and neighbor providers are have stepped in and um, have been historically supporting families um, in our, our um, around the state where we have childcare deserts. They're the ones that have truly stepped in and, and opened their doors to, to care for children. There are um, many that wish to become licensed. There are some that aren't interested and are providing care legally. There are many that wish to become licensed and this is the time to do it. So we have a number of strategies to help with um, reducing the barriers for family, friend and neighbor providers to become licensed. So we will provide, this activity five, will provide a one-time bonus payment for uh, a $5,000 for unlicensed FFM providers to become licensed. And then um, $500 for those that are CCAP qualified exempt. And we're happy to, to share more about um, that, those categories um, at, at, when we do a, another town hall. Um, so what is exciting about this activity is that once providers become licensed, then they'll become eligible for activity one, which are those recurring monthly payments. So we can support um, FFM providers with capital costs through their merging and expanding grants, which we'll get into in a moment. We'll help them with all the coaching and support that they need um, with our family child care home navigator, which we'll get into in a moment. Um, and, uh, and then this bonus of $5,000. So um, this is the time and we really want to support and break down any barriers that um, FFM providers may face um, becoming licensed. Okay, then we go on to the next slide, um, which is activity six. Um, and uh, I think the key here on activity six is that the pandemic and what you all have been experiencing over the last year and a half is the need for more localized knowledge um, about provider operations and slot availability. So when a provider has a slot that becomes open, uh, when a family, a parent um, wants to return to work and they're looking for care, this is the activity that will really support this work. So activity four will provide dedicated staff at our early childhood councils who we cannot live without. We lean so heavily on our councils to be the trusted partner in our community. Um, so this will provide funding and support to our councils to create relationships with licensed providers, um, establish preferred methods of communication, and then regularly um, obtain slot information, um, as well as information on the provider's um, capacity to serve special populations. So then the ECC staff, the Early Childhood Council staff will then feed this information into the existing um, child care resource and referral system so that when parents call or they're searching online for child care, they'll have real time slot availability. Okay, so now next slide. I know I'm going so fast, and this is so much information, but I wanna be sure to get through all of this. So just keep the questions coming and, um, and we'll uh, hopefully at the end of the presentation have some time, otherwise we'll follow up as I mentioned with that FAQ document. Okay, this I mentioned um, earlier up. Um, these are, this is the activity to support our family child care 
homes. Um, so licensed family childcare homes are, they're just a critical part of our mixed delivery system. Um, and they um, are able in many communities, they're able to meet the parent demand for infant toddler care, care during non-traditional hours, um, and linguistically and culturally responsive care. Um, and so this is our way of supporting that sector, um, as well as FFM providers who um, become licensed, this will also provide them with that targeted um, resources and support. So this activity is um, seeking to maintain and grow um, our uh, home, our family child care home provider population um, by funding our early childhood councils um, to hire navigators uh, to connect family child care home providers with the support and resources that they need um, to support business practices, support quality. Um, many um, family child care home providers um, often feel isolated. So how do we create a sense of community and really retain and grow their business? Um, and just a, just a side note for those of you that have been following Senate Bill 63 um, and the Infant and Family Child Care Action Plan, you'll see a number of the recommendations that were in that action plan reflected here. And then you'll see the recommendations of that report also reflected in our 10% and our supplemental discretionary funding that will, is still to be announced. Okay, so now moving on to activity eight. Uh, which is access to inclusive care. Um, we heard from parents across our state um, that we need to um, increase access to inclusive care and support providers with the resources they need to, um, to, to provide this care um, in a way that uh, addresses the needs in their community and also the professional development they need to really provide this type of um, inclusive care. So uh, we are going to utilize the expertise of the University um, of Colorado Denver Center for Inclusive Design and Engineering. And um, this team will support licensed child care providers in creating inclusive, universally designed learning environments. Um, it builds on the amazing work of the preschool development grant. Um, we you know, offered the mini grants and we're gonna build upon that um, to offer this support and resources to more of our um, state's childcare providers. Um, and then by winter 2022, um, providers can access the universal design and inclusion kits online, quick video tips, um, and tier technical assistance. So uh, by winter 2022, this will be um, available to all. Okay, then um, um, thank you. My colleague Grace just said we're hitting the, um, we're close to the 30 minute mark. So emerging and expanding grants. Emerging and expanding grants, many of you on this call, I think are, are uh, deeply familiar with this. This has been, tremendously successful in that um, the licensing specialists across our state are working side by side with our providers to help them see where can they expand um, uh, or new, uh, for, as I mentioned, FFM providers that want to become licensed, um, lifting up new ones. Um, that's what this grant is all about. So the grant amounts range from 3,000 to 200,000. So there's a significant range. And our priority is um, building capacity in childcare deserts. And again, infants and toddlers and children with special needs, which is what our state, what we need to move the needle on across our state. Um, the grant application process is open um, and we encourage interested providers to apply. Um, and then next slide um, is our CCAP strategy. Uh, and I think many of you um, are aware of um, this and, and increasing rates and increasing our absence payments. Um, and we have um, close to 37 million to uh, support this activity, which will serve our state's lowest income families, many of whom have been hit hardest by the pandemic um, and now more than ever need um, support to access affordable, high quality care. Okay, so those are all of our access. We've talked about 
stabilizing the workforce and then all of the different strategies we heard from you of increasing access across the state. Now we're gonna to transition to that next bucket, which is workforce strategies. Um, and so um, we could go to the next slide. Um, the, for workforce, um, what, we, um, what we know on this is uh, we are in just a, a, a serious crisis right now with our early childhood um, workforce. Um, we received recent data last week um, showing that we have lost seven to 10% of our workforce in the last year. So before the pandemic, right, we were in a crisis. And now after the pandemic, we've gone deeper with um, losing 10%. So we are tackling this with multiple strategies because we know to create sustainable changes in our workforce, we have to, we have to use multiple levers. Um, providers right now are closing classrooms, directors are stepping in to teach, centers are struggling to meet the childcare ratio requirements. Um, so similar to what I shared with Access, we need to stabilize our workforce, and then we need to build our pipeline. And so I am gonna hand it over to our senior policy advisor, Grace Eckel, um, and she will take us through our workforce strategies. Thank you, Mary Alice. So the first workforce activity here on this slide provides almost 50 million in funding for sustainability grants for workforce retention. Um, this includes for providers to be able to offer employee benefits, increased compensation, professional development, and also to hire additional staff. We know that retaining the state's existing early childhood workforce is a top priority through our pandemic recovery, particularly against the backdrop that Mary Alice just shared of a potential 10% loss to our state's workforce. Um, research has demonstrated that over half of the early childhood workforce experienced a reduction in their job hours and a decline in their take home pay during the pandemic. So these funds will help retain the workforce through the COVID recovery, especially to return educators hours and compensation to pre-pandemic levels. Additionally, with so many educators having left the workforce, these funds can be used by providers to rehire educators um, to return the workforce to its pre-pandemic level. Next slide. So the sustainability grants for workforce retention will be allocated on a similar uh, formula as the stabilization grants that Mary Alice shared previously in Access Activity 1, um, so based on capacity and quality level. The first table shows the total grant amount over the nine-month period, and the second shows the per-month payment. Um, we'll note that the stabilization grants under Access are, much, are very flexible. They can be used to cover operational expenses. However, these sustainability grants um, will be required to focus just on workforce retention. Next slide. So the Office of Early Childhood has worked closely with stakeholders, all of you, to identify and design strategies that support a whole variety of career pathways into the early childhood education sector. We are really excited that last legislative session, Senate Bill 21-236 enacted this scholarship program um, to provide funding for a whole menu of recruitment and retention options um, that are, can be customized to your community's local needs. We've directed additional stimulus funds into this grant to support a rapid infusion um, into workforce recruitment as well as retention um, following the pandemic and knowing that we're working ahead to the implementation of universal preschool in just um, a couple of years. So activity two totals um, 11.7 million to support uh, recruitment and retention program. And this activity builds on several other stimulus strategies that we'll discuss in coming slides, such as free 101 and 103 coursework, um, which is the minimum coursework to be a qualified educator, as well as an apprenticeship program. So 
Activity three supports a new grant program to in increase teacher salaries for those serving in CCAP programs. We know that early childhood teachers are among the lowest paid professionals in education, and sadly, one third require public assistance programs to make ends meet. Um, as Mary Alice shared, our CCAP families are our lowest income families and are those that really need the most um, support to affordable childcare through the pandemic recovery. So this um, activity three will increase the salaries of educators at participating programs by 1,000 to 1,200 annually. And we expect that this will support both the retention of the workforce currently, as well as to incent new professionals into the field. Next slide. Activity four removes the financial barrier for an individual interested in a career change or potentially someone who is unemployed following the pandemic. Um, individuals interested in continuing on in their education beyond these minimum um, ECE 101 and 103 courses could access scholarship funding or loan forgiveness from the recruitment and retention program that I shared earlier in activity two. These courses will be available to all students beginning in this semester, fall 2021. And we're working closely um, with the Department of Higher Education to make sure that all interested students and professionals interested in a career change are available of this amazing opportunity to access these courses at no cost at both community colleges and um, public institutes of higher education. Activity five creates a new registered apprenticeship program for early childhood to provide work-based learning opportunities. Childcare licensing requires that individuals have the minimum of ECE 101 and 103, which as I just discussed is now offered for free, plus work experience to be qualified to teach early childhood. This apprenticeship program builds on that free coursework and offers a paid work experience for individuals interested in entering the early childhood profession. Emerging research indicates that coaching and mentoring are significant needs to maintain the early childhood workforce. Activity six creates a new teacher peer mentor program to pair new educators with existing mentors that are experienced teachers in the field. Um, we expect that this activity will both support the professional growth of new educators to ensure that they have the real life teaching skills to succeed in the classroom and the leadership development of existing teachers as serving in that mentor capacity. And our final workforce specific strategy or activity is activity seven, which creates a free director training sequence, which is available both in English and Spanish. Directors are critical for the successful operation of childcare centers. And with additional training and education, they can be better prepared to support their employees. Well, equipped directors um, can help improve retention among employees. Um, and also increase the overall quality of care provided at the center. So now, um, next slide. So that takes us through access, which Mary Alice covered, and workforce. And now we'll transition to family strengthening. Um, research shows that children reach their fullest potential through whole child, whole family approaches that improve the protective factors in their community, environment, and relationships, both in childcare and outside of it. We have eight additional family strengthening strategies that put money back in the pockets of family, address the health and mental health of children and those that care for them, and support families at home in a number of ways. I'll now pass it back to Scott Gerginski, our, uh, the governor's special policy advisor for early childhood to share the first two strength, family strengthening activities. Thank you, Grace. And wanted to say that 
I just wanted to also compliment both Grace and Mary Alice for their outstanding leadership and who I, uh, two people that, who I work with very closely and you uh, all are, are really lucky to have such great leaders in the, uh, in the field. Um, these are people who are Mary Alice and Grace and all the staff at OEC are really passionate and committed to helping children and families and it's the real deal. So um, I so I wanted to say, you know, in terms of reducing, uh, so uh, I wanted to say in terms of reducing expenses and making family strengthening a real thing in Colorado, child care is, to start with, as you all know, child care is one of the biggest expenses that families face. And in, in, in the state, infant care costs nearly 10% more than the average rent. In Colorado's economy, we all know depends on working parents, working families with 70% of children under age six having both parents in the workforce. Even pre-pandemic, over half the parents, half of parents in Colorado reported having missed work opportunities because they either did not have access to care or could not afford it. The funding through the child care stabilization grants to providers will result in $100 million kept in the pockets of families across the state. That's almost half of those grants with families saving an average of about $400, $450 per child in tuition reductions over the nine month grant. Providers will be encouraged to first prioritize a designated families, designated funds, excuse me, to waive, fully waive co-payments for CCAP and other low income families, which could include those just outside of the CCAP eligibility. And after that, they'll be encouraged to reduce tuition payments for all families. And this again is a very high priority for the governor to make this burden lower on families. Next slide. Activity two builds on the first activity and it further supports families by lowering the cost of childcare for the majority of families enrolled in CCAP by lowering parent copay, the cap of parent copays at about 10% of family income for 5,100 families enrolled in CCAP. And that is a reduction from the current 14% of gross income. So this is a project that the state, uh, an initiative that the state has been working on and these funds will really help make this a reality. And so, you know, lowering costs uh, for, for low-income fam um, families stabilizes them, allows them to keep more money in their pockets going forward toward food, rent, and basic needs for their children while ensuring equal access to quality childcare options. And the effort builds on the reduced co-pays funded it's, it's funded by the curse of stimulus and it builds on what we talked about before the ARP, again, reducing CCAP parents' fees. And, and this went into effect about a month ago. It's about $6.3 million. And now I'm gonna pass it back over to Mary Alice to cover the remaining family strengthening activities. Great, thank you, Scott. Um, I just, um, I mean, just pause and think about the 101 0.5 million dollars is going to go back into families' pockets to offset child care. And the, the other um, outcome of this strategy will be many of our providers are operating uh, well below um, capacity. Um, and so encourage helping families to um, overcome that, that, that financial barrier to returning to work where we're really, um, we're just really excited about that strategy. Okay, so early childhood mental health consultants. So um, in addition, um, you know, to supporting families through lowering the childcare expenses, activity three supports the whole child, whole family approach through investing in our, um, in our state's early childhood mental health consultants. So this activity will bring the total number of our consultants across the state to 52. Um, this additional capacity um, will help ensure that our early childhood programs have the support they need to, um, 
to really um, respond to young children's mental and behavioral health challenges um, as children are, are you know, returning into the classroom. Uh, the, the next slide, um, activity four on this, are our health and our mental health grants. Um, so many children um, are returning to the classroom this fall after more than a year and a half at home during the pandemic. Um, and we've heard from so many, including our child care providers, that one of the top concerns is having the resources um, to support the health and mental health needs of children and our families and our workforce. So activity four um, offers a menu of options um, related to health and mental health. So it could be uh, mental health counseling for our workforce and families. It could be health screenings for children, um, family health education, um, uh, social emotional health trainings. There's just a menu of different options uh, that we'll be able to offer through activity four. And then uh, the next activity, um, uh, activity um, five, uh, is this the, yes, okay, so this one is, um, we heard from many of our partners, um, the need for expanding access to evidence-based health and mental health programs um, that complement you know, what I shared in activity four, um, the provider's grant. So this activity will fund our state intermediaries and partners to provide incredible years, um, pyramid and conscious discipline um, programming that providers wanna opt into. And then the next slide activity six is in, this is different, we're shifting gears here now. So this one activity six is in response to the growing need for filtered indoor indoor air, um, which has been highlighted by um, the COVID pandemic and the increase in wildfire smoke in Colorado. So activity six is a $3 million grant program for indoor air quality improvement. Um, and then our next slide um, is activity seven. So now we're moving into more of our whole family approach um, of home visiting and some of our um, child health treatment prevention programs. So what you'll see here in activity seven is um, uh, that we have, um, we're gonna be able to support our home visitors with the uh, purchase of additional technology to support telehealth. Um, and then we're gonna have um, the uh, support that's going to go directly to families enrolled in home visiting um, to help them uh, with um, some financial needs like for groceries. Uh, and then we're also going to provide training for home visitors um, on mental health issues. Um, so they're better equipped to support families um, in, on the, in their caseload and really support them in the way they need. Then we go to activity eight, next slide, which is promoting safe and stable families. Um, and this is to give additional support to families in all circumstances. So the funding can support families before and after involvement with child welfare. Um, it's, uh, we're going to use this funding to support occasional care for families. Um, given the a great need um, and the, for the, the fractured support systems families continue to face during the pandemic, we'll support families with and providers with technology for telehealth um, and then professional development similar to in home visiting. On the next slide, um, activity nine is our CVCAP funding, our community-based child um, abuse prevention programs. Um, so this is designed to really um, strengthen families before there's a need for any interaction with child protection in the first place. So this is one of our core family strengthening programs. And what we're looking at here um, is expanding services for families, starting at the birth of their child uh, by offering support at the hospital or the pediatrician's office, um, developing a campaign to increase and encourage connectedness with the social um, connections that we know are so powerful for families um, yeah. and communities. Um, and then um, there are also be funds um, to support systems for families um, uh, by training families for workforce, increasing data collection and some other resources for strengthening families. 
okay, we did it. Six six twenty <laughs> is just a lot. Um, I know uh, we went through so many strategies so quickly. Um, I um, again, you know, going back to the beginning of this presentation. Um, all of you that participated in our strategy development, I just want to thank you. And we 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 need you to be at the table so we can be responsive to our, our families' needs, our providers' needs, um, uh, our, our our entire workforce, and to truly um, utilize these strategies in a way that will transform our work, our early childhood sector. Um, we're just in a, a historical moment right now. And I, I just thank you all for being such strong advocates for children and families in your communities. So now we're gonna open it up for questions. I'm gonna hand it over to Lindley. Um, if you can um, uh, help us with that. Um, Okay. Yeah, um, we'll do Mary Alice. Okay. So um, we have a few hundred questions in the chat box. So I'm going to get to as many as I possibly can. Please keep them coming. That's where we're going to organize and make sure that we're capturing everything. Um, and we, as I've been referencing in the chat, and as Mary Alice let folks know, we're going to create a document where we will list every single question that came in. I'm logging them all. So we make sure that all of those questions get an answer. So I'm just going to start up at the top of my chat and work my way down. So um, the levels reference, the quality levels for funding, are they, are they excuse me, Colorado Shines levels? Uh, let's get that one to Karen Rosa. Thank you, Mary Alice. And yes, that is correct. They are the Colorado Shines quality rating and improvement system levels. Is there a maximum amount for the circle grant? Grace, do you want to take that one? Sure. Um, and I'll also ask that, uh, Angela, if you have anything to add, um, I'll pass it to you afterwards. But at, at this point, we are working through um, the design of the circle grants to include um, how we will ultimately prioritize the funding and determine that grant award range. Um, we're looking to a similar grant program that was implemented in the K-12 space um, through a prior stimulus fund um, source. And so hoping to take lessons learned from that to see what the appropriate amount is to meet the need while also serving as many um, uh, innovative solutions as possible. So we talked about some bonus awards that would be for serving um, infants and toddlers. Could we clarify what toddler age means? Karen. Yes, I can take that, Mary Alice. So um, for child care licensing regulations, tar toddlers start at 12 months and walking independently and go up to 18 months of age. Thank you. Um, this might be kind of a multi-part question or, or a multi-part answer, I guess, um, depending on the, the strategy, but um, for sites for child care providers that are tied to public school districts, how does that balance work? Karen, do you want to take that? Lindley, can you repeat that question? Yeah, it's so for the various strategies where funding goes to providers, if a provider is tied um, to a school district, how does that work? So child care licensing um, licenses all the public school district programs. So they are licensed, they're, they're treated the same as our other child care licensed facilities. And can I make one clarification? I, I said the toddler age, actually um, toddlers will, so, in the draft rules, we're, we're um, making some changes to the toddler age ranges. And so actually um, toddlers go from 12 months walking independently and can go all the way up to 36 months. So um, referring to our strategy where we will be funding um, councils to help us collect supply and demand. Um, does that also include CCRNRs, our child care resource and referrals, or how does that work? Uh, 
Who wants to take that one? Angela, Karen, Grace. I can start. So these funds would be used to um, amplify the CCR and our work um, by embedding uh, the outreach that we know um, councils are well positioned to do within their communities um, to collect that real time availability of information and support parents access to um, open slots or open positions within their community. Um, so it really builds upon the existing CCR in our work um, and further provides resources towards it. All right, um, next question. Can you receive an emerging and expanding grant for a second time? So I guess, can you receive more than one emerging and expanding grant? Grace or Karen or Angela, again on that one. Yeah, I, I can answer that. Yes, they can uh, receive more than one. Uh, if they expand again, they can do that. Okay. And Lindley, right. I'm just going to add on that really quickly. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, um, Angela. Sure. Yeah. Sorry. When we start awarding the employer-based child care grants, we're also going to release guidance for programs that apply for that, that they would also be able to still apply for um, an emerging and expanding grant because they will fund <laughs> two different activities. <laughs> All right. So will the grant funds that providers receive uh, be taxed as income? Are we going to receive a 1099 or will they be tax exempt? Uh, yes, yeah, sorry. So this is Lisa Castilla. My um, video seems to have stopped working for the night, um, but but yes, um, the grant payments, there's nothing in the federal uh, legislation that would make the funding non-taxable, um, but we are working, it, it is a part of the, um, it, it will be a part of the work of the vendor implementing the grant payments that they are collecting the information necessary to issue uh, 1099s to all recipients of grant payments. Thanks, Lisa. Um, there's actually a question I can take. So there's a number of questions coming into the chat regarding where applications are located and how we'll manage that. So um, as we've mentioned a few times, um, after the meeting, we will send out the slides, um, we'll send out um, the Q&A document, the recording of this, and we will also send out a web page that we're setting up on our Office of Early Childhood site that will include all of the information for all of these programs. So that will be a centralized place that you can look for those applications. And then of course, we always send out information via our email list. So we've dropped that into the chat a few times. I can drop it in again. Make sure you're signed up for our emails because that's also an easy way uh, to be able to access information on when applications open up and where they're located. Um, how can child care um, programs, how can their staff access the free 101 and 103 courses? Angela, do you want to take that one? Yes, and you're going to hear some toddler cooing in the background. Um, so we are working with our partners at the Department of Higher Education to create kind of a fact sheet for students to help navigate that process because from campus to campus, their student aid offices might be a, a little different with how they will um, administer the funds. So we'll have directions for that very soon. Um, for those that are taking the course currently, we're gonna be working on a reimbursement process and for the future semesters, um, we will be working on a no cost option so that they don't have to um, hold those costs up. Thanks, Angela. Um, so there's both the sustainability grants as well as the workforce retention grants. Can a provider apply for both of those grants? Grace, do you wanna do that one? Yes. 
So the um, the stabilization grants, as Mary Alice mentioned, are not competitive. They will go to all providers that are eligible, um, and they're based on license capacity and quality. Um, all providers will be required to complete a um, relatively easy application, um, and through that same application, they can also opt in to receive the um, the sustainability grants for workforce retention. Um, and as mentioned, uh, the sustainability grants, unlike the stabilization, can only be used for those workforce retention activities. But we certainly um, encourage providers to take advantage of both of those um, non-competitive funding sources and, and really to utilize all of the um, funding strategies that we outlined today. Um, to really have an impact in all of these three areas of work. Lindley, I see that time is 6.31. Um, maybe let's just take one last question and then we'll follow up uh, in writing on all the others. Sure, I'll pull one that just popped right up. Um, to qualify for an emerging and expanding grant, do you have to be open by a certain date? Angela or Karen? Um, you have to be open by uh, June of 2022. Well, I, I think we probably got through 10 of the 200 <laughs> questions. So um, instead of keeping you into the evening, uh, we're going to, to wrap it up now um, and just know that um, similar to what we did with the background investigation unit town hall, Lindley and our team will pull together all of the answers to your questions and we'll be sending that out along with the recording and the other information that Lindley mentioned. Um, again, I just, I want, we all want to just thank you for all that you do for children and families across our state. We're just um, so grateful um, for your dedication. And um, please reach out to us with any questions. Uh, and we look forward to seeing you all at our next town hall. Thanks, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you.